uh, although we, we can't know and we don't want to engage in psychobabble here, uh, it's easy to imagine that you might have gone in an opposite direction. You said, gee, uh, my father worked at this job and it killed him, although that's not precisely what happened. My mother is traveling all the time when I'm a young kid, and my uncle, whom I admire, is a distant figure. All of them do this kind of stuff. I'm not going to do it. What? Well, uh, two things happened, three things. Um, um, Jack Roosevelt Robinson became a Brooklyn Dodger in 1947, the first acknowledged black person to mm -hmm. be in modern Major League Baseball. And I was 15, and uh, Jack just captured mm -hmm. my imagination. And um, in my 15-year-old uh, um, view and in my 69-year-old view, there was mm -hmm. everything was right with Jack in 47 and in subsequent years. And um, uh, he was a wonderful ball player. He, uh, he, he was brave. He uh, had internal fortitude and stood up to uh, all kinds of viciousness and, uh, and uh, played brilliant baseball. He uh, never forgot that he was uh, a black person. He always pushed back when people were trying to encroach on either his own interior space or black race generally. Um, he was uh, physically beautiful, uh, and he was black, black and physically beautiful, rejecting the idea that, that black is, is ugly. Um, and the whole country was looking at him. Mm -hmm. So I think that if there had been any wavering in my soul, it, uh, Jack certainly uh, helped drive it out. And then, um, in, uh, then of course there was the Brown decision, which uh, I guess was in some way like uh, a uh, winning World War II. But before Brown, and even before Jackie Robinson, your family has moved to Grand Rapids. Yeah. And rather than living in a black enclave, as in Kansas City, or in the middle of the biggest collection of black people in the country, as in Harlem, now you find yourself living in a white neighborhood, surrounded on all sides by whites, and going to a school where you're the only black kid? What is, yeah. what is that like? Hell. It was psychic hell because it was, you know, I went there when I was uh, 12. And five years between 12 and 17 are pretty crucial years. Mm -hmm. And you're all mush. You're, 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 you're plastic and uh, the world just, and you're bumping up against a whole bunch of other people who are plastic. And the world, the culture is telling you who you are. Well, what does the culture tell a black kid he is in 1944, 45, 46? That's one of the reasons I guess I love Jack so, because mm -hmm. he came along when I was, uh, when I needed a psychic um, jolt. But it was horrible. Um, I, it, the, the culture makes black people ashamed of themselves. I was ashamed of myself. Uh, I was, uh, I wanted to be one of the guys. Well, I wasn't one of the guys. Mm -hmm. I was non-standard. Uh, and then, you know, when the hormones kick in and you start falling in love every mm -hmm. seven minutes, well, you don't. Well, maybe some people do, but I did not fall in love with the appropriate color-coded girl across town. Mm -hmm. Fell in love with the girl I'm in my locker here, you know, was fishing around for my books, and all of a sudden there's a girl next to me and she's stretching for something, and you see her budding form, and you see little hairs on, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, I mean, that's, and it was, you know, you can't touch. Don't, mm -hmm. don't even come close. Don't even think about it. And then, you know, there were, even though I ultimately developed, at first nobody would talk to me and they'd spit on my seat, bike seat and all that stuff. And they'd call me nigger and they'd chase me home. I mean, it was really quite ugly. Um, but after a while I formed a group of friends, one of whom is still a friend of mine. He's a retired judge. And we were, walked to school together every day. His parents have died and he treats my mother as if she's his mother mm -hmm. and he calls her my second mother and when <laughs> he takes her out to, to lunch around town about once every two weeks and people will stop by the table and say 
hi Don or hi Judge, and he'll say, I want you to meet Helen Clater, she's my second mother. People say, what? <laughs> but um, even then, when you, I had a group of friends, um, there it would split on social lines. I mean, they'd have hay rides. I didn't go. There were so I would say the, that psychically it was it was just painful as it could be, but it taught me the most valuable lesson of my life, which was that all of this stuff about the white super race was baloney. Mm -hmm. That uh, white people were just people, and some of them were smarter than I was, and a lot of them were dumber than I was, and some of them were better athletes, some of them were worse athletes, and so forth. And I think that um, my ability in later life to go into major American institutions and to affect change was a combination of imitating my mother's style mm -hmm. uh, unconsciously and that ease with white people that very few blacks have the opportunity, at least of our generation, had the opportunity to acquire.